about 45 to 60 is kind of the norm. Offshore, bigger fields. I'm David Micah, the president of the club this year. And let me just start by mentioning at the noon hour, the Dow is at 18,130, up 171 points. And the price of crude oil is $43.96. And uh, it's, uh, it's my indeed honor, and I hope that you will uh, join me in offering a warm welcome to the Economics Club of Florida of Gary Hemminger. Well, good afternoon, and uh, Dave, thank you for those very kind words. I, uh, I appreciate being invited here to uh, spend some time with you. And, uh, but I also want to just take a few moments to uh, uh, applaud Dave for uh, everything he does. I've known Dave for some time. And the American Petroleum Institute is, is a very, very responsible association and organization that, that represents all the oil, gas, refining, marketing, transportation companies in America. And, and Dave has been uh, a tremendous advocate uh, across the U.S., but most importantly here in Florida. Uh, for this very fine industry. And uh, thank you for all the work you do, and, and we appreciate that. In addition, I want to recognize Dan Munter. Uh, Dan, stand up. Uh, he looks like an academic today with the bow tie on. But, uh, uh, Dan uh, was with Marathon for 45 years, just retired at the end of the year. I told him he couldn't retire until I do. And he said, well, enjoy the next few years, because I'm retiring. <laughs> but um, again, thank you for having me here today. And I thought I would spend just on the front end a, a little bit of time about Marathon Petroleum and just tell you about our business and, and how we are a, a big uh, supplier to the state of Florida. And then I'm going to talk about crude prices and gasoline prices and where I think they're going to go. And, and I'll tell you on the front end, I think they're going to continue to go down a little bit from where we are today. And I just returned from uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So, uh, importers of, of Saudi crude, just the way it fits our system. Um, but I, I spent a, a few days in, in both uh, countries to just on normal business meetings, or I should say regularly scheduled business meetings that we have. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'll come back and, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, crude prices into the future. But as far as Marathon, we're the fourth largest refiner in the country. We refine 1.7 million barrels per day. Of, uh, of crude oil. We have seven refineries, four in the Midwest, and three in the Gulf Coast. And by the Gulf Coast, I mean Garyville, Louisiana, which is equidistant between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and uh, two refineries across the street from each other in Texas City, Texas. One we call the Galveston Bay Refinery that used to be owned by BP. We bought it two years ago. And another one that we've owned for oh, about 40 years, known as the the Texas City Refinery. But if you look east of the Mississippi, we're the largest uh, in the industry as far as refining, pipelines, uh, MPLX that uh, Dave mentioned. MPLX is a, is a master limited partnership. I'm sure many of you are invested in MLPs, but it's a master limited partnership that we are dropping down our logistics assets, eventually our marine assets, terminals, but it's a as I say, an MLP that is, uh, has had a tremendous growth trajectory, and we expect to continue to have a, a tremendous growth trajectory uh, with an MPLX. One of the largest, uh, as I said, east of the Mississippi, every uh, business we're in, uh, we believe we're number one or two in asphalt uh, that we were talking, Dave was talking about earlier, with the number one asphalt manufacturer east of the Mississippi. Uh, the largest marine system up and down the Mississippi and the Ohio River system. We're the largest supplier to the state of Florida, being with the Tampa, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Port Everglades, and Jacksonville are our big terminals. But we have a virtual pipeline coming across the Gulf of, uh, of ships every day. We have about five ships that we employ, and they're either unloading, loading, or crossing each other uh, in the night coming across the Gulf, about a two-day voyage come across from either New Orleans, uh, probably about two and a half uh, days to come across from Texas. Um, but we supply a, a tremendous amount of gasoline and diesel into this market. 
So we're, we're very proud of, uh, we, we separated from Marathon Oil. And a lot of people say, why? Finley, Ohio is a very small town. If any of you are, are from Ohio, you, you might know about Finley, but a very small town, just 40 miles south of Toledo. But people say, why Finley, Ohio? And why would, last year we were the 25th largest uh, company in the Fortune 500. So why would you be there? If you go back to the history of Marathon, which spans 128 uh, years, and Marathon Well, which initially was a production company, found a very, very shallow natural gas uh, field in, uh, in, in the northwest part of Ohio. And you've, I'm sure, heard that Toledo is named the Glass City. And in fact, a lot of uh, uh, small glass manufacturers, particularly with the auto industry, and that with, with the commercial industry, um, a lot of glass was made in Ohio. The reason being, they had very shallow, very clean, and by clean I mean very, very low sulfur content, natural gas, which was used in the manufacturing process of, of glass back when uh, the first uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and really skilled craftsmen, glass making craftsmen that came from Europe, they needed natural gas along with a lot of other minerals that we have available in the Great Lakes region, and, and that's why the glass system got started there. So back to Marathon, they had a very large uh, production system. Kim told me that she never had this problem when she was in charge today. Um, but, but we had a, uh, uh, a very big natural gas system that, uh, that Marathon went west, uh, out to what's known as the Yates Field in uh, southwest Texas, and they had the largest uh, oil field in the contiguous 48. So that's where Marathon got its start in 1986. The exploration production company moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, the downstream, as we call it, always remained in, uh, in Ohio. We're still importing half the needs into the U.S., so we're about a 16 million barrel a day. If you look at all the natural gas liquids that are required, about 16 million barrel a day market. So that says we're importing about 8 million barrels per day. And uh, my opinion is you just can't pull back one, uh, one you know, slice of the onion to, to fix a problem. In fact, we need a comprehensive energy policy. We need a comprehensive highway transfer. And the way the Energy Independence Security Act was written in 2007, it requires you to, to blend more ethanol going forward which in fact will take you over a 10% uh, blending component. I would submit that most of you, unless you have a flex fuel vehicle, most of you in here, the cars, your warranty on your car, if you look at it, will not uh, support any blending above 10%. So that's a big issue. We're, we're getting a lot of push from this administration. Um, and I'm not blaming this administration. A lot of push inside of the Beltway, not just this administration, uh, because this, Energy Independent Security Act, in fact, was put in legislation uh, under a prior administration. So I'm not going to get political about it. I'm just going to give you the uh, operating facts that if we're they're they're attempting and discussing the uh, potential to to require us to blend more than 10 percent. And my arguments are, we won't do it as a company. We're not going to blend more than 10 percent unless you, federal government. Uh, indemnify us and uh, for any uh, warranty issues beyond 10%. Uh, we've done a lot of testing. The American Petroleum Institute has done a lot of testing on cars, but more so small handheld, uh, you know, garden type, uh, you know, whether it's leaf uh, leaf blowers or lawnmowers, uh, because ethanol burns at a, a much higher temperature than normal hydrocarbons. So back in 2008, as you know, the downturn of the market in 08. At one time, crude oil hit $147 in, uh, uh, I believe it was mid-08, when we hit 147 And the Saudis have come out and said it was a real mistake to allow crude to go up and, and then eventually uh, settle down at about $100 to $110 a barrel. But they made a real mistake because what that did was that invited a tremendous amount of inefficient production into the marketplace. And not necessarily inefficient production inside the U.S. and the tremendous renaissance of production in the U.S. through shale development, 
um, it is, is just remarkable. The U.S. now being the second uh, if, and sometimes the largest producer of crude oil in the world. But we've gone from the depths of uh, the late 70s, early 80s, and now have come all the way back to being you know, one of the tops in the world. But the, the Saudis and other members of OPEC have said we made a mistake in allowing the, the, the price to remain at this high level. It invited a lot of inefficient production. And inefficient production, I'm not going to pick on any region in the world, but there's a lot of production that has come on stream that was invested and built expecting about $120 crude going forward and maybe escalating at a, you know, at, at a PPI or a CPI type rate, escalating uh, as, as inflation continues to grow. And I'm aware of some fields that even are expecting $140 crude when they invested in these fields to, to pay off that investment. <coughs> well, that's what they mean by um, allowing you know, inefficient production into the market. <coughs> and I will say that if you look at OPEC production, namely some of the big countries, um, you know, their production costs are probably $5 a barrel or less. I know some of them are less. So when you say they allowed crude oil uh, inefficient production to come on, so they're setting there curtailing their production that is maybe $5 a barrel to produce, but allowing other production that cash on cash, such as the oil sands in Canada, um, some Russian, uh, in other production around the world, that might be $75 to $80 cash on cash to be able to produce that, you, you understand uh, where the dilemma is in the world. I will submit to you that I think we're going to see $35 crude before we see $60 crude. And, and I think we're going to see $35 crude very shortly. You know, as, as Dave said, it's $43 this morning. You know, it, it had come down to like 47 went back up to hit you know high 50s it's now back to 43 and I'll tell you why I, I think this is the case and I I gave a speech in uh, early January at a Goldman Sachs conference down in, in Miami and I explained to the uh, New York analysts that were there so I must submit to you three things that you need to watch number one watch the level of foreign imports coming into this country and I have a I usually have a, a, a leg up on that view because it takes about 90 days to procure that, to load it, and eventually to, to sail to the U.S. So I kind of know 90 days out where that level is, is going. But I said, watch foreign imports coming to the U.S., watch the amount of inventory that is stationed in Cushing, Oklahoma, which is a big hub here in the U.S., and in Houston, which is another big refining hub, I said, watch the inventory balance there because you have all this domestic production that flows into those areas and then watch what the crude spreads are. Therefore, watch what a global price of crude is to a U.S. barrel and you're going to see a differential there. So those are the three things to watch and all three of those things is exactly what has happened. And this downturn in, in crude price is not demand-led. This downturn in crude prices is supply led. So when you have this swelling inventory that I mentioned earlier here in the US, and we have something that we call the contango curve. And what that means is if you're buying crude oil and you look 12 months out, what are the predictions and where is the money being bet on what the price of crude is going to be 12 months from now versus where it is today? And the curve says prices, as I said earlier, maybe $55, $60 by the end of this year, maybe $70 next year. So a lot of money is being bet crude's going to rise, which says you can hold crude in inventory for a while. You're paying, you know, maybe 50 cents to a dollar a barrel to, uh, to inventory that crude per month. So there, there are a lot of economics in holding on to crude oil. Well, the back end of that curve, I don't want to get into microeconomics here, but the back end of that curve is going to soften. And when that softens, this crude oil that's in inventory is going to want to go to the market. You take that, plus if there's a, an agreement with Iran, who knows what, what's going on there, um, you're going to have a swell of inventory trying to get to the marketplace, which I think is going to dampen crude prices further over the next few months. But I was, will say that uh, you know, by May 1, I think we'll see $2 gasoline prices in the U.S. I think that's, that's where things are going.
um, over the next you know, 90 to 120 days. Crude's going to come down a little bit more. Gasoline prices, uh, which bodes very well, I think, for the U.S. economy, bodes very well for families. It has a tremendous pent up frustration of families who want to travel. And uh, now that gasoline prices are where they are, uh, and, you know, we, we see every day through our big, uh, our big stores what the uh, buying pattern is. People will buy gas, those, those who are commuting to work will buy gas about 1.4 times a week. And a, a tremendous amount of our customers are pay, you know, buying, back when prices were $3.50, $4, they're buying $25 to $30 at a time. Now they're filling their car because just because of the discretionary amount of, uh, of money that they have available. And with that, uh, I'll uh, stop on uh, getting too windy here. and love to take a few questions in the time we still have available. We need to invest in all forms of energy, wind, power, solar. The, the country and the globe is going to need all forms. But for all of us in this room, and I'll tell you for all of our grandchildren in this room, hydrocarbons will still be the most efficient and best way to be able to run this economy into the future. I really appreciate uh, you having me here today. Thank you very much. So he gets to talk about a lot of stuff that I don't get to talk about because I represent all the companies. But it's great to hear an individual uh, perspective from one of our CEOs today. And uh, as a token of the club's uh, appreciation, Gary, I wanted to present this limited edition uh, bronze sculptured eagle by a local artist, Sandy Proctor, for you to uh, remember your appearance here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it.